ranking five different versions of Cruella de Vil. Previously on this channel, we've ranked different versions of Cinderella and her ball gown, as well as a variety of different Snow White films. Today, we're going to be doing more of the same. In honor of the recently released live action reboot slash prequel, we're going to be taking a look at different iterations of the fashionable legend that is Cruella de Vil. Because this is the internet, and I have to say this, obviously I don't condone Cruella de Vil's actions. There's no arguing that kidnapping puppies in the hopes of making them into a fur coat is absolutely horrifying behavior. But that's also what makes her such a great Disney villain in the first place. Cruella is an awful person. She just so happens to be fabulous. Today we're going to be looking at five different versions of Cruella de Vil in film and TV and see how they compare to one another. We'll be looking at everything from Cruella's wardrobe to her motivations, and at the very end of the video, we'll rank them. Anyway, let's get into it. 101 Dalmatians Made during Disney's Silver Age, 101 Dalmatians was first released in 1961 and was eventually followed by a direct-to-video sequel 42 years later in 2003. Based on characters from the book The 101 Dalmatians by Dodie Smith, the film follows a litter of Dalmatian puppies who are dognapped by the villainous Cruella de Vil in the hopes of turning them into a fur coat. Walt Disney first read The 101 Dalmatians in 1957 and immediately saw the potential it had as a children's film, buying up the rights and having Bill Peet, who had previously worked on Disney's Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan, adapt the story. 101 Dalmatians begins with Pongo, a Dalmatian, attempting to introduce his pet, Roger, to another young woman named Anita, who herself has a Dalmatian named Perdita. While initially an awkward meeting, both pairs begin relationships and soon enough Perdita becomes pregnant. Anita, darling! Where are they? Where are they? For heaven's sakes, where are they? Who, Cruella? I don't- The puppies! Anita's old schoolmate, Cruella, makes a surprise visit to the family, annoying Roger and scaring the dogs with her behavior. After Perdita gives birth, Cruella stops by the home once again, insistent on purchasing the puppies, but Roger firmly declines, prompting Cruella to swear revenge on them all. All right, keep the little beasts for all I care. Do what you like with them, drown them. But I warn you, Anita, we're through. I'm through with all of you. I'll get even, just wait. You'll be sorry, you fools, you, you idiots! Months later, when the family is out of the house and have left the puppies at home, two burglars hired by Cruella break in and steal them. After discovering that their puppies, along with 84 others, are at Cruella's old country home, Pongo and Perdita venture out to find and rescue them. I want the job done tonight. How are we gonna do it? Any way you like, poison them, drown them, bash them in the head. You got any chloroform? I don't care how you kill the little beast, but do it! And do it now! Worried that the police are on to their scheme, Cruella orders her men to kill and skin the dogs. But the puppies are able to escape and are reunited with Pongo and Perdita. She's a devil. Oh, a witch. Oh, what do we do? We have to get back to London somehow. What about the others? What'll they do? As they journey home, they are chased by Cruella and her goons, who accidentally get into a car accident in the process, leaving Cruella ruined and incredibly put out. You idiots! You, you fools! Oh, you imbecile! Ah, shut up. Roger writes a song about Cruella, which proves to be massively popular, making them quite wealthy and successful. On Christmas Day, the dogs finally make their way back home, and Roger and Anita decide to care for the group of 101 Dalmatians using their newfound wealth. In the very short sequel film, Roger, Anita, Pongo, Perdita, and the puppies are preparing to move into a new home in the countryside that will finally be big enough for all of them. The film largely follows one of the puppies, Patch, and his escapades around London as he attempts to impress his TV hero. Not even stole a, a muff? A pair of mittens? No. One mitten? No! Now unable to purchase furs due to her previous crimes, Cruella briefly attempts to satisfy her obsession with art, but finds that it simply isn't able to compare. This could be it. This could be the cure for my craving. My 
my analyst said I should find something to substitute for my magnificent obsession. <laughs> no, 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 darling. I don't want you to make art of the puppies. I want you to make art with the puppies. Use their coats as canvases. Create a masterpiece in a new medium. How could you do such a thing to the cute little puppies? Poison them, drown them, bash them in the head. With help from her goons from the first film, they're able to get their hands on the puppies, but Patch is able to rescue them and help them escape. Once again while chasing after the puppies, Cruella gets into an accident, winding up in a river, where they're picked up by the police. Now driven completely mad by her obsession with Spots, Cruella is sent to a mental institution while the puppies rejoin their family. Spots? <laughs> I do see Spots, you know. <laughs> they're everywhere! <laughs> In the book, Cruella is depicted as a glamorous London heiress with a cool temperament whose one and only love are fur coats. Isn't that a new fur coat? <laughs> My only true love, darling. I live for furs. I worship furs. Ooh, do you come in a medium? The animated film follows much of this characterization, but gives the character more of a crazed and volatile personality. In the animated films, Cruella is depicted as exceedingly wealthy, unbelievably entitled, and exceptionally moody. We're giving up. Oh no you don't! We'll find the little mongrels if it takes till next Christmas! Now listen, you idiots! What does Cruella de Vil have left to live for? I'll make shoes out of you! How marvelous, how perfectly! Oh. Oh, the devil take it, they're mongrels. No spots, no spots at all. What a horrid little white rat. <laughs> Unlike many other Disney villains, Cruella is seeking neither power or revenge. Instead, she is simply trying to satisfy her own material desires, which in this case is a Dalmatian spotted fur coat. While she does her best to not get her own perfectly manicured hands dirty, she does take control when she feels she needs to, though it rarely seems to help the situation. She's a shallow, egotistical maniac with a wicked temper who cares about absolutely nothing aside from furs, something that affects her decision making to an extremely detrimental degree. Despite being one of Disney's most memorable villains, Cruella actually has very little screen time in the first film, which is honestly a huge testament to her character movie and you're labeled for life. Appearing as a very chic yet chilling person, her character's design is simple yet instantly recognizable. Her two-tone hair makes for a creative visual that draws comparisons to the puppies she's so obsessed with, while the rest of her wardrobe shows that she's a woman of means and style. Animator Mark Davis, who was known for his character work and had previously animated Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, was assigned to the task of creating the look for the character of Cruella de Vil. This was uh, really the one of the most fun assignments I've, I've ever had in the studio. She was uh, a funny villainess. Well, what she was doing wasn't very nice. She herself was an entertaining character. Mark Davis, of course, was known for not only designing Cruella de Vil, but also single-handedly animated her throughout the film. Davis stated that he took inspiration for her character design from Betty Davis, Rosalind Russell, and Tallulah Bankhead, with Cruella's voice actress Betty Lou Gerson inspiring the character's prominent cheekbones. In early concept art for the character, she looks less disheveled and a touch younger than she appears in the film, but for the most part her look was solidified early on. In the film, the character wears a tight-fitted black dress to emphasize her thin frame, while her coat is incredibly oversized to match her personality and represent her insatiable love for fur. The overall look of the character not only expresses her motivations, but allows her to stand in stark contrast to more simply dressed characters like Anita and Roger. We can also see that Cruella's wardrobe, including what she wears while lounging in bed, is an ode to old Hollywood glamour, and in a way it allows us as the audience to understand that people like Cruella are of the past. A fun fact about the character is that she was almost put into another Disney film. During early production of the 1970 film The Rescuers, Cruella de Vil was originally intended to be the villain. Concept art showed the character with a brand new 70s inspired wardrobe, now featuring scaly motifs to fit her swampy new surroundings. Unfortunately, the idea was abandoned as the studio wasn't interested in making sequels at the time, and Cruella was replaced with Madame Medusa. However, you can still see Cruella's influence on the character as both have similar outfits, demeanors, and even driving habits. 
Although Cruella doesn't get much of a backstory in the animated Disney films, I don't see that as a negative. All you really need to know about Miss DeVille is that she's rich, she likes fur, and she'll do anything to get what she wants. Now every night I almost go insane I hear those witches chanting in my brain Cruel, 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 a devil, devil, devil 101 Dalmatians Long before Disney started turning out a different live-action adaptation every year, there was 101 Dalmatians starring Glenn Close. Released in 1996, the film follows the story of its animated counterpart, with just a few contemporary twists. Now the head of the fashion brand The House of DeVille, Cruella is just as obsessed with fur as ever, and after satisfying her urges with everything else under the sun, she eventually turns to Dalmatians after one of her designers, Anita Dearly, shows her a sketch of a spotted coat. I did leopard spots in the 80s. Well, Dalmatian spots are a little different, aren't they? Cozy. Cuddly. Classic. Less trashy. Exactly. I look wonderful at spots. It is rather amusing, isn't it? <laughs> what is? Well, if we make this coat, it would be as if I were wearing your dog. She kidnaps Anita's puppies, but after they're able to escape, she's caught and arrested for her crimes. The sequel film, which I actually prefer to the first, begins with Cruella being released from prison after being cured of her fur obsession. Now going by Ella, her sickly sweet persona, she works to restore her reputation and makes amends to the animals she's hurt. Cruella eventually reverts back to her old self and sets out to get revenge on the Dalmatians, hoping to turn them into an even more ostentatious coat. And of course, her plan is thwarted. A large part of the brilliance of these films is in its casting. By having Glenn Close as Cruella, the films benefited from the public's perception of her. In 1987, Glenn Close starred in Fatal Attraction, a psychological thriller where she plays a young woman who develops a deadly obsession with the man she has a short-lived affair with. Her performance was so impressive and terrifying that she was not only nominated for an Oscar, but she changed the conversation about infidelity and was often referred to as, quote, the most hated woman in America. Glenn Close even said that after the film, quote, men still come up to me and say you scared the shit out of me. Sometimes they say you saved my marriage, end quote. After Fatal Attraction, there was an entire generation of men and women who saw Glenn Close as the ultimate villain, a bunny boiler. 101 Dalmatians would have her go on to terrify their children. Glenn Close was heavily invested in the creation of the character, saying in an interview, quote, I was really determined that Cruella be as bad as possible. I hope Cruella is the character that people love to hate. I think Cruella basically has no redeeming human characteristics, except she does have a sense of humor, albeit wicked. She's a great character. She's gleeful in her evilness, and there's something very engaging about that. I think it's fun to hate somebody and deplore their behavior and then get a kick out of it. It's in the tradition of all the great villains. Keep the little beasts. Do what you like with them. Drown them for all I care. I think Glenn Close's insistence on a truly evil character is a large part of why the films work. We have absolutely no remorse for Cruella and are simply waiting for her comeuppance. Glenn plays Cruella in an incredibly clever way, having the character embrace the camp and comedy while still feeling rooted in reality. Her character is still as gloriously over the top and loud as her animated counterpart, but is far more glamorous and imposing. If you've ever seen The Devil Wears Prada, Cruella has very similar passive-aggressive tendencies as Miranda. Snappy one-liners and all. Marriage. Perhaps. More good women have lost a marriage into war, famine, disease, and disaster. And you must be Rufus. No, it's, it's Roger, and it's a pleasure, Mr. Ville. What's a pleasure? Now go, stand somewhere till I need you. She's going to have a baby. Is this true? Yes. Oh, you poor thing. I'm so sorry. How do we get out of this mess? Piece of cake. While the films themselves might be for children, there's no denying that the costumes are for grown-ups. Designed by the late Anthony Powell, Glenn Close's outfits in the Dalmatian series were amazingly avant-garde and deliciously over the top. Director of 102 Dalmatians, Kevin Lima, said of the costume designer, quote, Anthony, in a way, is an amazing director because he has to look deep into these characters and visualize them. And he doesn't just perceive what they wear, but also who they are and how to create layers of character based on their clothing. 
Powell not only designed the character's clothing, but her hair and makeup as well, creating a villainously regal look that Glenn Close attributed to her success at getting into character. In the films, Cruella is dressed in an array of spectacular outfits, from power suits to ball gowns, and each is more impressive than the last. I'm particularly fond of this flame gown in the second film, which seems to be an ode to some of Terry Mugler's work, but this version of Cruella is probably most associated with this outfit or this one. When Cruella is in a professional environment, we typically see her in black and white ensembles with exaggerated shoulders and sharp lines in an ode to Chanel. This allows her to not only look more dynamic on screen, but creates a more imposing appearance that almost makes her seem inhuman. When the character transforms back into Cruella in the sequel film, we even see these physical attributes reappear in an exaggerated manner, showing the audience how her monstrous behavior is represented physically. Her outfit that seems the most similar to her cartoon counterpart is this red number at the end of the first film. The colors seem to be a clear ode to her name and temperament, while the general shape is incredibly reminiscent of the outfit her cartoon self wears. It's definitely one of her most gaudy outfits and feels like a fitting thing for her to wear when she finally gets what's coming to her. All of Corella's outfits in the film serve a dual purpose of being fashionable yet funny, so I could honestly spend an entire video just talking about their deeper meaning. But let's do that another day. For now, all you need to know is that Glenn Close was born to play this role. Once Upon a Time If you're unfamiliar with the premise of Once Upon a Time, allow me to describe it as simply as possible. The show follows a small town of people who, unbeknownst to themselves, are fairy tale characters who've been cursed into the real world by the evil queen. We meet characters like Red Riding Hood, Pinocchio, and even Cinderella, all of whom have their own modern world counterparts and intricate backstories. Cruella de Vil is one such character. Cruella's fairy tale counterpart loathes her mother and desires to be rid of her, which she is eventually able to do after being given the power to control animals by a magical quill. She uses this power to have her mother's own Dalmatians kill her, and then butchers them to turn them into a coat. The ink from the magical quill accidentally spills on her, turning her blonde locks into her distinctive black and white hairdo. In the modern world, she has been living an incredibly privileged life, but loses everything when the FBI seizes her belongings, and she sets out to return to her former glory with magic. A lot of other things happen over the course of the series, like Corella eventually ruling the underworld, but that's way too much to get into here. I'm still waiting to hear how you're going to stop us from leaving, Fuzzy, because all your magic can do is make a dog roll over and beg. I'm not a huge fan of Cruella having magical powers as I think it totally ruins her initial character, but in the world of Once Upon a Time, it does make sense. Like many of the villain's backstories, Cruella's does inspire some sympathy, but she proves to be such an evil and vindictive person that she becomes one of the easiest characters to hate. I thought you cared about me. Oh, that was the idea, darling. You were, what is the phrase? A means to an end. Unlike other versions of the character, Cruella is no longer motivated by her obsession with fur, but instead power, and as a result the majority of references to the character's origins are only in her wardrobe. Unlike some of Once Upon a Time's costuming that actually took creative liberties with the fairy tale characters, Cruella's is spot on to the point it's disconcerting. I can't stand the bizarre eyeshadow into eyebrows makeup look that they have going on. And the two-tone hair looks like a cheap Halloween wig, even though it could have had the potential of being incredibly chic. Her actual clothing isn't bad, however, and I can see it as a solid modern interpretation of Cruella's look. Descendants the franchise that single-handedly killed Ever After High. Disney's Descendants revolves around the children of famous villains and heroes in a high school setting. Cruella de Vil is the mother of Carlos, and they, along with other villains, have been banished to the Isle of the Lost while the heroes prosper in the United States of Oradon. Who would touch up my roots, fluff my fur, and scrape the bunions off my feet? Yeah, maybe a new school wouldn't be the worst thing. Cruella, who is much more vain than other iterations, has taught her son that dogs are vicious animals, and as such he has an irrational fear of them. I read somewhere that they allow dogs in Oridon. Mom said they're rabid pack animals who eat boys who don't behave. Carlos, they have dogs in Oridon. Oh no, I'm not going. Oh! This thing is a killer! He's gonna chase me down and rip out my throat! 
When the children are invited to attend school in Oridon, their villainous parents come up with the idea to have them steal the fairy godmother's wand to use it for evil. After Carlos meets and befriends an actual dog, he discovers that they're not as frightening as he was led to believe, and for the first time, he finally stands up to his mother. Carlos! Is that a dog? It would make the perfect size for Eobob. <laughs> He's the perfect size for a pet. Oh. This dog loves me, and I love him. And FYI, your dog is stuffed. Oh. So give it a rest. This is the only film in the trilogy where we actually see Cruella, and while her son is a great character, she comes off as an odd choice for a villain in comparison to Maleficent, the evil queen, and Jafar. Don't get me wrong, killing and stuffing pets is no doubt terrible, but it's hardly on the same level as having actual magical powers. Compared to the designs of Cruella in other films, this version is a bit lacking. Her distinctive two-tone hair instead looks like your average age-induced graying, and while I'm sure Disney didn't want to show any support of the fur industry, her outfits look boring and cheap. This iteration of her character is still meant to be fashionable, but I have a hard time believing it based off of what she's wearing. Cruella. If you asked me what I thought about Disney's recent live action adaptations, I'd be honest and say they're not my cup of tea. It could be my age showing or my inherent bias against blatant cash grabs, but I find that the majority of their live action films are missing the magic that makes the animated films so beloved in the first place. Cinderella is one of the few that I've been able to enjoy, and that's mostly because of the costuming and Kate Blanchett. I did enjoy Maleficent as well, but I'm also a sucker for Angelina Jolie, and then they went and ruined it with a completely awful and unnecessary sequel. In spite of my history with Disney's live actions, I was still incredibly excited for Cruella when I heard it was announced, and the few glimpses I'd seen of the costuming actually looked promising. After finally watching Cruella myself, I can safely say that it's one of the better Disney live action films, but it's still flawed. Although it's intended to be the prequel slash origin story to Glenn Close's Cruella, Emma Stone's Cruella feels like an entirely different person. Honestly, if you're about to watch it, think of it as its own thing. Cruella, whose real name is Estella, is somewhat of an outcast, an artistic genius who is regularly misunderstood by her peers, which results in her lashing out and rebelling against authority. After her mother is killed and she's left an orphan, she teams up with two other kids, Horace and Jasper, and they spend the next few years as petty criminals in order to make ends meet. Estella develops a talent for fashion, with her dream being to work for the House of Baroness, an haute couture brand run by Baroness von Hellman. She eventually gets a job at the Liberty department store, starting at the bottom of the food chain as a cleaner, but eventually her talents are noticed by the Baroness, who offers her a job. At first, Estella is in awe of and inspired by the Baroness's talents and power, but after finding out that she might have played a part in her mother's death, she seeks revenge. Instead of going after the Baroness directly, Estella develops her alternate persona, Cruella, and uses fashion as a way of upstaging and embarrassing the Baroness in public. Everyone is laughing at me. Cruella. What sort of a name is that anyway? Okay, a proper competitor. I'll just have to destroy her as we have so many before. Find her. After framing the Baroness for Estella's murder, she decides to live on as Cruella. One of the reasons I always struggle to get on board with prequel films is that for the most part, you already know what's going to happen. We already know that Jasper, Horace, Roger, and Anita go on to play a larger role in the future, so nothing of consequence is going to happen to them. As a result, moments in the film that are supposed to be tense and suspenseful are now predictable, and the only character we're left remotely interested in is the Baroness, as she's wholly unique to the film. Obviously, it's Cruella's origin story, so she's one of the original characters that has to be featured in the film. But including the others not only feels cheap and lazy, but it retcons a lot of their stories in a way that I think Disney is going to regret when they try to combine the Emma Stone and Glenn Close Dalmatians universes. Horace and Jasper in this film could have been named something else, but retained their personalities and storylines. And it would explain why Cruella in the future treats her goons so cruelly, as they're perhaps a painful reminder of her childhood friends. As for Anita and Roger, they're incredibly inconsequential to the storyline and just as easily could have been left out of the film entirely. 
This also would solve the problem with the end credit scene, where it's revealed that Pongo and Perdita were not only gifts from Cruella, but siblings. And it's a tiny nitpick, but I really hate that they changed Anita's last name to Darling. Yes, it's a fabulous name, but it absolutely ruins one of the original Cruella's best lines. Anita Darling, what a fabulous name. Anita Darling. Anita Darling. <sighs> A large part of what makes this take on Cruella feel so different to Glenn Close's is that Cruella isn't meant to be an anti-hero with an anti-capitalist take on fashion. She's an undeniable villain who uses money to do and get whatever she wants. What would it cost us to start again on next year's line? Millions. Can we afford it? Well, yes. Yeah, Thank you, darling. Now go away. Sure, an argument could be made that Emma Stone's Cruella is on her way to becoming as wicked as Glenn's, but if you're still a dog lover even after Dalmatians Kill Your Mother, I have to wonder how in the world she's ever going to get to the point where she wants to make a coat out of them. Unlike the animated film, Cruella is a child in the 1960s, with the majority of the film taking place when she's a young adult in London in the 1970s. The film specifically places Cruella within the punk rock scene, as noted by her edgy Vivian Westwood-esque clothing. Estella's wardrobe features a variety of edgy looks in all black that have her appear in stark contrast to the Baroness's 1950s Christian Dior-inspired outfits. The movie presents the Baroness as the villain, with Estella slash Cruella as the flawed victim, and the differences in the two women's wardrobe is purposely symbolic of their opposing outlooks on life and their conflicting personalities. The Baroness is condescending, arrogant, and pompous, with her stiff wardrobe reflecting her unwelcoming nature, social status, as well as how she's behind the times. Estella is slightly nervous, awkward, and self-effacing, and as a result her wardrobe is simplistic, although it's in the little details that we can see the madness lurking underneath. She's intended to be representative of the punk rock fashion movement, but I personally think she's just a little too put together for it to be accurate. The movement was kind of known for being grimy and low class. Cruella's show-stopping, unconventional looks represent how in this form she's more radical, outspoken, and all-around unhinged. While I do like Estella's wardrobe, and I think it would work as a stepping stone to the beautifully tailored suits that Glenn Close wears as Cruella, I personally don't love a lot of Cruella's outfits in this film. I understand that fur has fallen out of favor, and Disney probably didn't want to get in trouble for glamorizing it. But if that was the case, perhaps making a film about a fur-obsessed villain wasn't the best choice to begin with? The company even said, quote, In our film, the character Cruella does not in any way harm animals. Cruella doesn't share the same motivations as her animated counterpart. So why make this movie in the first place? Considering the film is set in the 1970s, a period where the fur industry was booming, they easily could have found vintage furs from the time period that would have been appropriate for the character to wear, or they could have used faux fur when constructing her new garments. In fact, I'd even say that this would be a better time to have her develop a love for fur, as it would show that Cruella's obsession has spanned over numerous years. It wasn't a one-off moment because she thought Dalmatian spots looked cute as a coat. Fur is what defines Cruella, and by taking that aspect away from her character, they've essentially destroyed her entire identity as a villain. Out of all the outfits Cruella wears over the course of the film, only one feels like the character we know and love. This checked number. And I think the reason is obvious. It's the only one that features anything that looks remotely similar to fur. Even her other outfits, many of which seem to be an ode to Glenn Close's wardrobe with their pagoda shoulders, just look like fashionable pieces that anyone in a high fashion film could wear. None of the wardrobe seems wholly unique or understanding of Cruella's character, and it's one of the biggest ways that the film fails, at least in my opinion. I know I probably haven't gone into as much depth into the fashion of Cruella as you all hoped, but I do plan on doing a style analysis of the costuming in this film and 101 and 102 Dalmatians in the future. In the meantime, I would highly recommend checking out Mina Lay or Hot Lamode's videos about the fashion in the film. The rankings. Now that we've gone over all five versions of Cruella de Vil, it's time to rank them, starting from the worst and ending with the best. This is going to be heavily biased, so don't get too mad if my favorite isn't yours. Descendants. Considering the lack of screen time she's given, it's no surprise that this is the lowest ranked Cruella on the list. I'm also not a big fan of her character design. Once Upon a Time. 
Over the course of the show, her character's storyline gets more and more ridiculous, but the initial premise and backstory is interesting enough. I don't love some of the aspects of her character design, but I appreciate how committed they were. Cruella While her origin story is interesting, I can't get behind the lack of fur and the retconning of her personality and motivations. It's a perfectly decent movie, but is she Cruella de Vil? 101 Dalmatians there's a reason why she's become such an iconic villain over the years, and her unapologetic evilness is a big part of that. 101 Dalmatians. I mean, you knew this was coming. Glenn Close is a gift. With Disney already announcing a sequel to Cruella in the hopes of combining both of the Dalmatians' live-action universes, this definitely isn't the last time we're going to see Cruella de Vil. Which version of the character is your favorite? I hope you enjoyed this video and don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you soon. Bye!